Welcome to The Art of Medicine, the program that explores the arts, business, and clinical aspects of the practice of medicine. I'm Dr. Andrew Wilner, and my guest today is Dr. Deborah Blaine. Welcome, Deborah. Thank you so much, Andrew. Deborah, you were one of my first guests, episode number five, and because now we're in the 50s. And thank you for being brave enough to come on a new show. And uh, at that time, you had your first very exciting new novel, right? Code Blue. And I read Code Blue, and it was a lot of fun, definitely worth reading, pretty exciting, and I'm kind of on a medicine theme because you're a practicing physician for many, many years, and also a New Yorker, I, I dare say, that does come through in the book. And, <laughs> uh, and I was born in New York City, and I, haven't, uh, I didn't live there for very long after, uh, when I was after being an infant, but I, it's always a place that's sort of in my blood. So I, I, if you're from New York, I think the novel will resonate uh, even, even better. But today you're here because we're going to talk about novel number two. Undue influences. You know, some people have like one novel in them and they get it written and that's it. You know, they never want to sit down and commit because it's a big commitment. How long does it take to write a novel? So the first one took me about 24 months, I think. The second one took me about 12 months. So only one year of writing uh, almost every day? No, I got to be honest, no. <laughs> every um, week? Every week? Or do you, you write know, in spurts? I feel like I, you know, sometimes I went a couple of weeks without writing, um, but sometimes I was writing every single day. And when it's when it's hot, it's just like flying, you know, flying off my fingers. And then sometimes, you know, I get, I think it's inertia that kind of slows me down. And I have to, I have this mantra and I have to tell myself it's not going to write itself. It's not going to write itself. And so like right now I'm, I'm really excited about the research that I'm putting into the to the third novel. And so sometimes that's really fun because you have to have the whole background in your head before you start writing. And even though a lot of that background's never going to make it to the page, just so that everything is internally consistent. Right. And I think it's fair to say that even though you may not have been typing every day, that there's a lot of uh, mental writing that's going on as you uh, process, because a lot of people think writing, you're sitting down typing. Well, yeah, that's writing, but that's kind of like the, the last step of writing. And certainly things can evolve from there, but you have to kind of at least have a clue what you're gonna say before you actually start uh, typing. Uh, isn't that right? So yeah, I call it percolating. It percolates back there. But um, so when I wrote Code Blue, I knew pretty much I had a plot and I knew what I was going to say. When I wrote Undue Influences, which was very, it was actually harder. I'm not going to do it like that again. Um, I knew I had an opening scene because my mentor, um, who I met at Seek, uh, Rich Provolin, who helped me with Code Blue, he, you know, he said, you got to have an opening scene that grabs people. And otherwise they're not going to finish reading your book. You need an opening paragraph that's going to grab someone because, you know, why should they, why should they care about the, the character and why should they care about the book? So, um, so I had an opening scene in my head and I knew that I wanted to talk about extremism in this country and how people really don't listen to each other and, and how that's evolving and why that's so dangerous. Um, and I wanted to use the devil's breath flower, which um, Vice wrote, Vice did a whole little video on the devil's breath called it the scariest drug on the planet. And that's all I kind of knew. And so I just started writing and, and then I, I kept going and I, I wasn't entirely sure um, how I was going to end it until I realized I couldn't solve the societal problems in one book. <laughs> so then I was able to kind of close it up, but I had a really good time with the characters and, and I, you know, I, and I, I, I think my favorite thing about writing is creating these persona and then really developing them and watching what they do. It's like you, you put them on the page and they do their thing. And it's like, even if it wasn't what you wanted, what you, what you had planned, they just say, no, that's not what I'm doing. That's not my character. This is my character. And this is what I would do. Kind of like the, the actor in a screenplay who's the wannabe producer who says, no, I don't think that my character would do that. You know, only, you know, I, I felt like, you know, I had to listen to those characters because now they had their own life, so to speak. So it's a lot of fun. Does and book number two have a message also? Definitely. So the message is um, that we need to think for ourselves. 
that we need to not jump on whatever you know our friends are doing or what our friends opinions are what our political party's opinion is just because it's coming from the party doesn't mean that every single thing that the party says is something we should be protesting and standing on a platform that we really need to evaluate issues one at a time for ourselves and and then be, be secure in that and it doesn't matter if if you and i don't agree with each other it doesn't matter you know we can still be friends and 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 the you know the we're we're still alike in all the ways that really matter, and and we have differences of opinion, and that's that's a good thing because it makes us think. Well, you know, I never thought about that. I never thought about what that would cost the population if we do that. So I think it's really important that we provide this service. But how are we going to pay for it? You know, it, like things you know things that people don't necessarily they just they just get riled up, and the media is a big problem in this because the media has so much control over our minds and, and what we think about and what our perspective is. Even if the, the New York Times and the Washington Post, they tell you what to think. They tell you what your opinion should be. Well, I would agree. You know, as a journalist, I've noticed that there has been a blurring of news reporting and editorial articles, right? where it used to be, well, you know, this happened. And then someone would comment and say, well, this happened and this is what I think it means. But, you know, of course, the way that the tie, even the headline is written, you know, uh, for the same event can really color, you know, how, how that event is in, interpreted, you know. Uh, and you can use the example of, you know, uh, uh, one country attacking the other one, you know, are they defending themselves from a threat or are they the aggressors? Right. And the language that's used can really uh, right. color things. Well, your approach sounds very Talmudic to me. You know, the rabbis, right, have a long history mm -hmm. of uh, having different opinions, uh, which, which didn't lead to fisticuffs, right? Uh, they would just right. sort of study and they would write their long opinion and another guy would study the same thing and write his long opinion, right? Right, right. There's a long you know, until tradition of that. Sometime in the 80s, um, or up until the 80s, news articles were required to present both sides of the story. It was a requirement. You couldn't just put your opinion out there. You had to say, you know, one side did this, but the other side did this, and you had to present both sides. And then they did away with that. And now it's gotten to the point where I read an article, and it and it actually, you know, the the this, the factual article is written in the first person. The person is saying, "I felt, I think this." And like I don't want to know what you think. I don't want to hear your voice. I just want to hear just the facts, man. Remember Dragnet? Just the facts, man. Just the facts. You know? Just the and, facts. And and we don't get that anymore. It's really hard to sift through and get that. All right. Now tell me what's fun about your book. Why why should I why should I pick it up? Okay. So uh, so Undue Influences opens up with this kid Joshua walking into his uncle's office in New York City. So if you're as a New Yorker, you know, the whole most of this book takes place in New York City. So um, so if you're from New York, you know, you'll you'll recognize that, maybe relate to that. But so he walks in and and he sort of stumbles in. He's been searching for some place and it seems a little bit familiar. He goes in, he's he's completely disoriented, his mouth is dry, he's um he's got this splitting headache. He can't remember where he's been. He barely knows his own name and he's covered in blood. And when they get him to the hospital, they find none of the blood is his. So this kind of launches him on a like what happened to me kind of kind of you know journey and his uncle who's really the protagonist in the story um, has a uh, was subjected to this this drug when he was three years old and it has created some changes in his his mental status so that he's more equipped in many ways but he you know when he was younger he looked at, like almost more on the spectrum and but he discovers that uh, some, someone is completely controlling the minds of so many Americans. And then he discovers that it's happening from both sides, from the conservatives and from the liberals. And he gets caught in the crossfire between the two. Um, and it's, uh, and then, you know, there's, uh, for me, the character development is, is just, so his sister is a, is a total misfit, um, but she, she grows a lot. And uh, she's actually my favorite character. And, 
in the end, I mean, so it, it, it explores the use of the devil's breath flower, which Vice named the scariest drug on the planet. And it explores this idea that um, the things that we hear, maybe we shouldn't just take them at face value. Maybe we really need to examine them and decide, is this my thought? Was this thought planted on me? So in the book, it's planted on you, but in reality, it's also planted on us. And so how do we break through that? And, you know, and what Russell's message is, is you really have to think everything through. That's a lot of effort. Most people don't want to do that. But if we don't do that, then we're just, you know, so the, 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 the cover has a, a brain on marionette strings. So, ah, okay. Okay. So well, as a neurologist, yeah. I appreciate the, the brain on the cover. Great work. Great work. <laughs> Yeah, but we're, we're really being controlled um, very unconsciously. And even when we know we're being controlled and we think, you know, okay, I got past that, then we don't realize we slip into it again. And so the, um, but I, I think that the journey, I mean, I had a lot of fun writing it. I love the characters. I, I love the, these characters more than I did for my first book. And you have to like your characters because you spend a lot of time with them. Now, are there friends of yours who are asking you, hey, was, was, was that me, you know, or were you modeling that character after? I mean, there must be some, you know, where did you get these uh, characters from? Did you just make them up out of thin air or did you base some of the features on people that you might know? No, actually, in this book, I didn't. In the first book, I did a lot and people recognized people. Um, in this book, there's, and I'm not going to tell you who, but there's one character who, rem who, started to take on some of the more unpleasant characteristics of a family member of mine. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm not going to say who the family member was, and I'm not going to say who the character was, but, um, but that's, I think that's the only, um, and I ended up not liking this character as much as I had originally intended to. It's like, it's one of those things where the character just said, no, I'm not, you know, that's not who I am. This is who I am. And, but I also in a weird way got so, some insight into the family member that I had issues with because as I wrote the character and I said, well, she's, you know, not, not going to do this because that's not who they are. Um, and then I started to think about my family member and say, well, maybe that was some of the motivation there. And maybe I need to cut them a little slack. So it's interesting. You learn a lot about yourself when you write, I think. So where can I get this book? So you can get it pretty much anywhere. You can get it on Amazon. Um, you can get it in Barnes and Noble. Uh, if you're in New York, Steve Israel, former Congressman Steve Israel, opened a new bookstore, Theodore's Books, in Oyster Bay, and he's carrying it. And if you're anywhere near there, I would love it if you would support his local bookstore because he's a fabulous guy. Um, you can get it uh, at WarrenPublishing.net, which is my publisher. Um, pretty much, you can, you know, it can be ordered online from anywhere. It's in a bunch of the Barnes and Nobles, even around the country. So I think um, they, we got it into Barnes and Noble in Austin, in Cherry Hill, New Jersey, and in Philadelphia, um, all places that I have some sort of peripheral connection to, Houston. Um, but you can, you can just go and order it. Or you can go to my website, which is DebraBlaine.com, and you can find links to it there. Oh, excellent. So tell us, just to switch gears a little bit, what are you doing with your spare time? So with my spare time, I'm working part-time in urgent care again, um, but I'm also coaching and um, I'm coaching, I primarily coach doctors who are unhappy. And one of the things that, you know, I've learned in coaching and, and just sort of in life is that one of the things that gets us stuck is when we have this picture of ourselves that's really hard to break. So I realized that the reason, one of the reasons I'm still doing clinical medicine after 30 something years is I still see myself as a clinician on some deep level. And when I can get rid of that, that vision, that paradigm of mine, then I will be able to completely break out of medicine and, and do just what I wanna do. So one of the things that I coach is for people to start to change you know, the way they think about themselves so that they, they, can, they can become something that they really want to be, something that's, that's sort of lying inert inside them at the moment, but would give them so much more happiness. And it doesn't have to be out of medicine. It doesn't mean that, you know, just because they're not happy in whatever medical field or whatever institution they're working in, it doesn't mean that they have to leave. Uh, sometimes they just need to tweak it a little bit. 
And it's amazing is people, especially doctors, I think a lot of doctors tend to be afraid to ask. We don't ask for stuff, you know? So to just say, I would be happier if we could do this or to point out to their, their leadership that you would make more money if you let me do this because you got to speak their language. So, um, so Very yeah, so I do, I do some coach, coaching and I'm doing writing and I'm, and I'm uh, still working 20 hours a week in the clinics and I apparently rescue cats but uh, that's a whole other thing. <laughs> All right. Well, I expect there's going to be a, uh, a very appreciative and forlorn uh, cat in the third novel. Somewhere there's going to be a little cat. Is that right? There's two wolves at the moment. Two um, wolves. Okay. Two wolves. Two wolves. The, yeah. Well, put a cat in from, just for me. So that one. I was I really, actually oh, there's my cat. There's but my with cat. your request, I'm, I'm going to definitely do it. <laughs> That's great. Well, Deborah, this has been a great conversation. I want to thank you for appearing once again on The Art of Medicine. I wish you great luck with the second novel and uh, not too much uh, tearing your hair out time with the uh, third. Thank you so much. It's so, it's so much fun talking to you. I always enjoy it. I appreciate everything that you've done for physicians as well. This program is hosted, edited, and produced by Andrew Wilner, MD, FACP, FAAN. Guests receive no financial compensation for their appearance on the art of medicine. Andrew Wilner, MD, is Associate Professor of Neurology at the University of Tennessee Health Science Center, Memphis, Tennessee. Views, thoughts, and opinions expressed on this program belong solely to Dr. Wilner and his guests and not necessarily to their employers, organizations, or other group or individual. While this program intends to be informative, it is meant for entertainment purposes only. The Art of Medicine does not offer professional financial, legal, or medical advice. Dr. Wilner and his guests assume no responsibility or liability for any damages, financial or otherwise, that arise in connection with consuming this program's content. Thanks for watching. For more episodes of The Art of Medicine, please subscribe www.andrewwilner.com.